I think it's time to start. Warmly welcome to Moderna Museet and the auditorium and the programs we do in con connection to the Moderna exhibition uh, 2018 with the future behind us. We are having five artists presentations here and uh, first of all we will listen to Joa Jungberg and also Santiago Mostin and uh, they will do a short introduction to the theme of today. Welcome. Hello, nice to be here, nice to have all of you here. Um, I will be very short, I just would like to say that I'm so very happy that we do not only have this large comprehensive exhibition upstairs with the future behind us presenting 36 artists and artist groups uh, but this large-scale project the Moderna exhibition 2018 has also made possible a publication the one that you see on the screen here in and beyond Sweden uh, which gives uh, yet more insights into this rich and vibrant art scene and if you are interested, you will find it upstairs in the bookshop. I'm also very glad that we have this rich program of performances, lectures and talks, uh, which has made, been made possible very much thanks to a very fantastic collaboration with Katrin Lundqvist, who is sitting here. Uh, my colleague Santiago will now shortly speak um, about the connections between the artists that will present their works here today, because there are certain reasons why we chose this particular artist to um, speak uh, in this room together today. They're, the body is very present in their work, and there is also a recurring performativity. And they all somehow uh, have works in the exhibition upstairs that together build the first thematic grouping of the show that we have chosen to refer to as the vulnerable body and the view of the other. Hi, uh, yes, thanks again uh, for coming. Um, I'm not going to say too much because I think we're all here to listen to these uh, five artists give their presentations. Um, the main, the sort of first room of the exhibition, and I think the first theme or way that we thought through this project was to find a way to try and come to terms with or, or break down or understand uh, larger political and cultural forces, but um, via the scale of the human body. And uh, in different ways, the, the artists who are here today are going to be presenting their projects, which um, work through this either uh, gesturally, uh, through performance, um, through drawings or sculpture, uh, but where we don't see an illustration of, of, of specific incidents that have taken place, but rather something that has been uh, taken into the body of the artist and then expressed in these, uh, in these uh, particular ways. And We'll have a little discussion at the end as well, where we'll ask a few questions and things like that. And I have some thoughts as well that I want to bring up about uh, translation and how translation works between not just languages, or not just written languages, but languages of the body. Um, I'll leave it there for now. Uh, the first artist presenting is uh, Mohammed Ali. Welcome. Hello, um, thank you, you are here. Uh, I want to talk a little about this project, uh, which is in the entrance. I start with these drawings, it's 366 drawings. I start to do this project in Damascus in 2012. Um, I, I made uh, 366 different creatures and with different uh, mysteries in their body. And this uh, project is coming up after like the war start actually in, in Syria. And then um, I start to think 
about my feeling in the city and what the changes happen in, in the people life and uh, the way the people understanding everything. Um, so uh, there was always something from inside it's like pushing me to work this uh, uh, to do these drawings to work with these bodies it's like you are like dreaming in the streets but you are awake you are your eyes is open but it's like you seeing different levels of the city different levels of the people uh, it's, it's like something different happening around it's like dreams but you are awake you are living in uh, so I went back to the mythological creatures and then I th I like where is it that the, their forms their uh, it's coming from so uh, I, I suppose that in this project if like all the mythological creature is uh, the, the their shapes is coming from uh, what happening around what the effects uh, to uh, from society from environment from everything and then I suppose if now in this day we have like mythological creatures um, affected by what happening around um, in Syria in the world not like specific in Syria actually it's like different things uh, so I built first I built these bodies which is uh, some of them it's really fiction some of them it's really back to the different culture like in my in my unconsciousness is uh, is something uh, coming from the family and uh, or it's like uh, I always like to remember it, like, when my mother she was uh, making drawings on and the curtains or the pillows, and when I ask her what is this coming from, she say we don't know. It's just we know it. <laughs> we know how to do this, and we know these creatures, and we have like some names, but we don't know where it's from. When I came back and made research and w what this imagination and how this imagination is also affected by like different situation in the whole area and uh, and yeah, I start to, to work on this in this way to have like uh, different effects from different uh, levels of the life and and made these uh, creatures uh, and second part it's coming from my work in the city um, and then I collect s stories to bring this creature to life to talking about them in different way to talk about the society not uh, about the creatures itself uh, and I made like this drawing. It's one. Uh, it's one story in one drawing, which is not here. <laughs> it's about. Uh, yeah, it's good to like how I to to say how I start to work in different way on this project. Uh, and then I built. I made this drawing, which is uh, it's upstairs. It's different stories from different places, different times, different is uh, it's a lot of details. You can just go upstairs and then look at the details and every details is like is a uh, one story and there is a uh, yeah uh, well and then I made this video and also it's connected to what happened in the city in same subject like thinking what happened and how, what the change is happened in the people life um, I mean this video is about falling down and when I started it so I I saw a lot of people falling down in street like it was unusual in city to see and the reaction it was like unusual actually to see the people like feeling 
um, different from before the war. Like first, before the war, when someone's fallen down the street, they start like to cleaning them, their self and then shy, feel shy, and then try to disappear from the street. But in that time, I saw like people start to shouting, swearing, it's like to say, it's like not their body is fallen down in the street. It's like all their life is fallen down in, in this moment. So, uh, that <clears throat> that this works I have to mention is like uh, I meant uh, four thousand drawings. So th why I mention that because I want to say how it's connected to to my body to inside me. It's not something I can do it <clears throat> just in 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 five minutes or in one day. No, it's something I lived with. I, I I was walking more, looking for what's what's happened. So that that's like I lived with these works. I lived with this process. How this changes uh, happened. Uh, how this change is coming through. Not only the others, it's also me. It's for so that's. <coughs> That's what I mean. It's like something is inside you. It's pushing you. Even you cannot touch it. It's not like you touch it by your hand, but is there is touching. There is something uh, embodied. There is something. It's not just like a frame or how we say. It's not just like a, a normal story we live and then we forget about it. It's something. It's just coming and pushing me to to work on this <coughs> this uh, project. And I have another parts of this project. I also did the portraits for these uh, creatures to to bring them life. And then I have stamp uh, invited audience to stamp on paper and then take the drawings with them. And uh, the other part in the show, Endless Day, uh, Endless Days, is uh, last work I did in Damascus before uh, I came here, before I left. So it was about waiting time, how, how this waiting, it's uh, maybe you are just sitting in, in, in a bus. But there is another imagination is coming up. It's, there is another. Uh, there is another like uh, waiting times is is uh, like another creature is coming catching you in the, the place where you, are you sitting. It's uh, it's like my room. It's become like not room. It's become like world full of the surrealistic images of what I'm waiting for and what what is this uh, waiting um, well well it's, it was about uh, what I have to do with this also because the work is pushed me how what I have to do so after this work actually I left Damascus uh, uh, the city I mean, this is good. Yeah. Um, if you have like any question, you can just ask. You just stop me. You don't need to for later. Later we have different conversation maybe. And so um, this works, which is in, in the show, is. Uh, it it's something is coming through through what you know and what you you learn to do uh, but in same time you don't have any control to do it it's not i i just sometimes i look to this creator i just think it's not my choice to do it it's like this works this creature they push me to to work 
to, to, to bring them to this life, to, to in this shape. And it's not prepared by sketch. There is no sketch before. It's just, it's just a, I did it. <laughs> it's just work on it. Even like the big drawings, it was, it was just, I start to, to make the drawings and then the shape, the general shape is coming up like, uh, but I didn't mean to first to make this shape to, uh, or to make sketch to fit my creatures inside these shapes. No, but it's, uh, uh, this shape is coming later because when I start to work about the, some subjects and then the work itself is made as a shape and then I try to, to make it a clearer shape uh, in general. Uh, the work. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Are there? Hello. Hello. <laughs> Are there any immediate questions to Mohammed? Then we can take them now. I have one, which is sort of personal maybe, but still. Uh, I mean, you were doing these uh, pictures during burning war time. Can you describe how it was to work on it during these very hard conditions? Is it possible to? Yes, please. Oh, uh, I think. I mentioned this, like how I started the, the worries, but uh, well, even if there was like a hard situation, it's like war and, and the fears and uh, all these things, but uh, it was still as an artist, I, I found my tools, which was like helped me to work with for uh, like a paper. Even it's like we just think it's very simple things. It's just a paper. No, actually, it's not just a paper. You can't find it. I can't find it in Europe. I don't know why. <laughs> why these uh, things? But but when I found it, it was that the idea of this paper. It was I use it for like cleaning oils from freighted potatoes or something. It's. I took the, this concept of, you know, to take in that dirt from, from the other things. It's like organic things. It's just taking this dirt. It's taking this oil from the other things to make it clean. So when I start to make these drawings on these specific amazing papers, I also had this idea. What I'm doing is it's this way to, to, to cleaning. You know, to, to converting what's happening. It's like stacking what's happening on this paper to become a drawing. So that's one level of how I work. It's like the, the materials and the tools, which is was important to, to, to work in this, this period. Uh, because before that, I don't think so, so in that way because everything was possible and we had like different uh, good European kind of papers. Uh, well, and the other side, which is was like, even I didn't, when I stopped to draw or to do something, but I was still thinking all time because when we, for example, when we talk about the fear, uh, the fear is, it's not just something you can just like take it out. It's live with you in every moment. It's, it's continue with you. So when I was um, even walking in streets and, and, and in that time it's like you don't know when you will die. But my mind it was still working even inside this fear and to, to, to preserve what what to what happening to to look uh, what's uh, what's change happening because it was really like 
something I want to talk about. I want to show it. It's not like the media thing. It's something more about the people life. Yeah. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay. Then we continue. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, and the, the work of Mohammed Ali, you find it in the beginning of the main hall of the exhibition, the drawings there and the video. Uh, Nick, next uh, speaker is uh, Dinis Majado, and uh, he is uh, no, yeah, I think so. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I didn't have my paper <laughs> in front of me. <laughs> it's Dinis. He's coming here, and uh, he is uh, doing performances in the exhibition every Tuesday and every Sunday, two times per day. And yesterday he also was doing a performance here at the stage of the auditorium. Welcome. Thank you. Uh -huh, I see. The projection. Hi, good afternoon. Um, yeah, I was. I had a big doubt about uh, talking with you or reading, and uh, I ended up deciding on reading. But uh, we'll see, because we are talking after. So I think we. I had very much this impression that I could say different things if I would talk, but at a certain, at the same point, I was very afraid that I was too nervous. So let's see. <clears throat> when here is not the place to be, one can always invent another. And this is a sentence from the performance that I showed here yesterday. I was born in Porto in Portugal in 87, 13 years after the end of the longest dictatorship in Europe. I grew up hearing from my mother about a new world to come, a social state, a world that was not made at the service of heterosexual wealthy white families, but where minorities had now a voice. An inclusive world where stories about feminists that had stories about feminists practicing inclusive world, with uh, practicing and fighting for equality of access, it had students at May 68 opening plural sexualities, it had new family constellations, it had a will to regulate industries and create a sustainable relationship with the environment. It had social investment in fighting misery and promoting social mobility and redistribution. It had empowerment and legitimation of unions. It had this notion that if you would get lost in life somehow, you would not be alone. There would be mechanisms in place to help you because we would, we would be together as a social state regulated to level economic differences and to fight gender, sexual and racial discriminations amongst others. We lived in the 90s, in Portugal at least, the fast illusion that this was now established. The state, as our will, had provided the mechanisms to support the citizens when they didn't have the means to. It was a world where things can always coexist with other things, where a community, an ecosystem would not depend on agreement, where one could state divergences and talk about it without being an enemy, where the idea of normal was now sort of cancelled since everyone was kind of different but at the same level somehow. Or at least was that the direction. It was a world built on the symbolic fall of the figure of the dictator, and we did patriarchy as well, and its multiples. The husband, the country, and the boss were there to be reformulated, their maleness to be queered, and their supremacy to be cancelled. A world where one and where a one closer to everyone would actually actively be called to perform citizenship and be restored of their potentiality. 
I'm sorry, this is a bit uh, also basic, but I thought that in the times that are running, maybe it's good to just pass through it. So, I moved from Portugal in 2012 in a very different scenario, at the peak of the economic crisis that took over southern countries of Europe and was used by the northern Europe as some sort of like virgin land of liberal investment that inaugurated a massive and hyper-accelerated hyper process of gentrification that converted full countries into holiday resorts for white, wealthy and bored populations, converting the whole local populations into some sort of a uh, mass company of house cleaner and Airbnb administrators on minimum salary. And minimum salary in Portugal is our days a uh, bit more than 500 euros. Um, so the two works uh, that I'm showing within Moderno Stelling and Site Specific for Nowhere that is being shown in the exhibition space and Cyborg Sunday that was shown here in the stage yesterday. Um, they were created through the last six years since I moved uh, to Sweden in 2012 and are two different and complementary sides of my experience and my process of migration to Sweden. Uh, one, uh, site specific for nowhere, that is in the exhibition, is some sort of dystopic celebration of a patrimony of struggle built over a grammar of precarity, anxiety and poverty. And the other, uh, uh, Cyborg Sunday that was here shown yesterday is some sort of consubstantiation of a possible alternative and an utopic future. So somehow I always see these two works uh, as like two sides of the same coin or the negative and the positive of the same sculpture. In Site Specific for Nowhere, I revisit a series of practices where I explore materialist ideas of citizenship I explore a spiral structuralist revisitation of walking and standing activities where stepping is multiplied and unfolded into a densified activity. Some kind of hyperactive restatement of being here, belonging here, having the right to be here. As a material event more than a conceptual truth as they are when we talk about rhetorical discussions about the right to be here or bureaucratic processes. There is something quite absurd in discussing the right of someone that is already here to be here. Walking, the iconic action and symbol of the pedestrian body that was so much the symbolic and pragmatic essentialist center of the Judson Church grammars in, that is a very big uh, uh, stone in the dance history. Walking became here for me, or I worked with it here, in some sort of anti-essentialist statement, distorting it, hacking it, decomposing it into, multiple, into a multiple plurality of abstract variants, substituting the idea of a minimalist process of reduction that lands in some sort of essential anthropomorphical truth, a final essence that is one and unsubstitutable, uh, for a multitude of de-anthropomorphized de patterns where reduction and sublimation shows itself as a process of guidance and choice that leads, that can lead potentially to a multitude of sublimated bodies and movement patterns. A displaced body that instead of even attempting to integrate, and this is an important word, or mime the elegant patterns of whiteness embraces its own anxiety, its precarity, its absence and its stolen history into a precarious folklore of a culture to come, a folklore of displaced bodies together. A body that more than searching to find its identity is instead actively building it as an embodied fiction made with the random possibilities and patrimonial leftovers around one. A gesture that becomes an activity from stepping into an anarchist dance that unfolds blurry and canny identities. This quite, this quite pedestrian activity developed into a dance or a ritual where movement dwells and maps and, and maps sets of relations with a space where the performance is happening and the body itself that continuously metamorphoses and therefore remaps itself. A site specific for nowhere a performance that can happen in any space 
that can make any space theirs. Not because it ignores it, but because it lives of its encounter with it. The performance exists of an absent history with this space that is drawn through the performance in a continuous process of dwelling. A paradoxical gesture of autonomy and inscription, a movement that exists within the body while grounding in its context. Claiming to be here stops being a rhetorical argument and to become an irrefutable evidence of vibration and energy. In a very different direction, Cyborg Sunday starts with an answer to an artistic community dispersed through Europe with the raising of the economical crisis in Portugal. I mean, I will make an interruption here. And uh, this piece really started from, I started working on this piece maybe one year and a half after moving from Sweden. And I, I was very much dealing with this question that suddenly you're 27 and all your friends are spread in the world, basically, because, I mean, Portugal, at a certain point during the, in 2012, arrived to levels of 40% uh, of unemployment under, on people under 30 years old, which means that basically no one of my friends lived in Portugal anymore. Um, so at a certain point, to move is not to just move. I mean, sometimes these things are talked in such an like, abstract way, but I mean, to move to a country or to be withdrawn from your context, it's much more than uh, learning Swedish language. It's about having to rebuild the whole process of socialization and the pro uh, process that structures your identity because your identity is built in relation with other people as well as your art practice. It's always in relation to another people. So uh, Cyborg Sunday really started from this kind of melancholic feeling of that all the people that I used to resonate or that I used to dialogue with uh, were unreachable anymore. And that, uh, yeah, suddenly you are like very by your own. So as an answer to this dispersion, I started creating an imaginary, and, and sorry, and also this question that uh, this place didn't exist anymore. It's not that you had moved to a place where you could return every three months like Swedish people do, they go and they live one year in the US and then they come and your friends are all here. No, it's like, it doesn't exist. The country where I lived doesn't exist anymore because people just dispersed. As an answer to this dispersion, I started creating an imaginary day in a place where some of my friends were living together. They were not doing something big, they were just engaging in their routines of living together. I described this day to myself over and over again with as much detail as possible. To think on every gesture we were doing in this place was to consubstantiate it, to make it exist as an artificial memory. The performers that are part of this work never had access to this as a written text or they never memorized it as they do in theater. I just told them this story and they worked through the months to recall and retell creating and emulating every image, every gesture, every of these persons, making them exist in an almost tangible way through this exercise of continuously visualizing, telling, and almost experimenting this story. And this was, I mean, uh, we worked with this day of these people in this island. Uh, they would like, from doing drawings of, uh, do, drawing the plans of these spaces, uh, drawing every movement that they did, every object that they touched in which way uh, until the point that they kind of felt they had been there. Uh, and yeah, and what they do in the performance then, it's going through this memory. So th they don't have like set sentences or dialogues or they know what is happening and they are trying to describe it together. So they are somehow forced to uh, be synced in being in this fictional place together. So this was what I was written here. <laughs> um, they project in the near future of tom uh, they project this story in the near future of tomorrow that is too soon to be an epic utopia and too close for the melancholy of a memory. They are engaged in creating a reality, a practice of remembering that becomes evidently simultaneous to the one of of the public, the audience that is watching the performance, in constructing this image and making this place collective somehow. 
While doing that, they go simultaneously through a physical score that proposes a set of relations in between their own and each other's bodies. With a critical approach to the scientific maps and sources of, somatic and abs uh, of somatics as absolute and therefore normative descriptions of the body. I mean, somatic practices in dance, they deal a lot with like medical descriptions of the body that ob and also like uh, some strange uh, psychological metaphors. So, um, for example, there is a lot of uh, metaphorical ideas about the kind of energy that uh, your uh, your uh, sexual organs can produce what obviously if we think this in terms of uh, trans questions and cr trans criticism is very problematic that someone uh, outside of one's body can kind of define what kind of energy your body produces um so um with a critical approach to the scientific maps and sources of somatic practices as absolute and therefore normative descriptions of the body, these tasks propose instead a post-somatic perspective, demanding a full embodiment and non-distanced engagement with their practice, but asking indeed for a relation with plural psychedelic fictions projected inside of the body. Movement is something produced as a secondary product, being the center of the attention of the performer in their sensorial relation, undermined by these artificial fictions. Through an, ana through an analytical division and administration of movement production, the performers are led in the paradoxical exploration of a practice that asks simultaneously for embodied animism and critical awareness at the same time. The audience observes movements difficult to place being that they are recognizable as gestures in the sense of an action that produces something but is too abstract to have a specific name. We witness a group of performers engaged in strange but criterious actions which emptiness allows them to echo and consubstantiate the ones from this imaginary place uh, that the performers are engaged to describe. So my practice and the methodologies and games that constitute it are constructed over my small and paradigmatic narrative of performance and not so much on the hegemonic and quite white history of performance. It is a contaminated mapping where iconic figures like Trisha Brown is side by side with Manuela, an artist in my hometown that is always with a video camera everywhere but had never shown any video and that becomes a figure on my performance Cyborg Sunday. So, this is some sort of exercise of rejecting absolute contingencies and remembering myself through this reorganizing that we are provisory, we exist as a provisory formulation, we are somehow a doubt. And so is theater as a dispositive. These fictions and the exercise of keeping this reality in movement through this choreography of rearticulation of the same references. The exercise of practicing that a situation is never the result of the sum of the parts, it is never the product of circumstances, as it is the name of a very iconic performance in the 90s. Because there is not one unique product of circumstances, there are multiple. The situation is always the unavoidable active choice of how to do, how to assemble, how to dwell, how to be with these circumstances. And here we arrive to a center core of my research or practice, an understanding of movement, not as a displacement, a physical displacement of the body, but as an ever changing specific quality of being, persisting, inhabiting, positioning, transforming. There is a very specific word in Portuguese, much more specific than the so branded saudade. And this word is star and uh, that is to be in Portuguese, translated, and, and, and this is, uh, so to be in Portuguese is translated into two very different words. One is ser, that means to be in an identitarian and or permanent sense, uh, like to be Swedish, to be blonde, to be a woodworker. And star that is used for provisory situations that are even though too long to be an event, longer than a to-do and that uh, become provisorily identitary somehow, like to be exiled, to be a traveler, to be homeless, to be in a room. 
There is also this delicate situation of terms that can be used with both verbs. One can star homeless or one can ser homeless. And sometimes dignity is the ambiguous border in between these two verbs. So I research movement neither as a to do, neither as a to be. I work on movement of to be uh, as this first gesture of citizenship, as this moment when everything can still fall apart and the body fights to root in some provisory meaning that allows, him, uh, allows them to start uh, a starting point to build existence and dignity. Coming from uh, some sort of like contemporary classical education on modern dance and theater and visual arts, and the paradoxical experience as a, perform a performer in collaboration with companies and choreographers working with a late minimal and conceptual paradigm so strong in the 90s, at least in Portugal. My own work is the search to escape to this dichotomy, an attempt to look to the stage neither as a space to be filled with, the mimesis of someone else acting somewhere else, as it happens in like classical theater, neither to be used in the fundamentalist and so doubtable search of um, a certain absence of representation, assuming that the naked stage and the performers as a demasqueraded dispositive in its kind of raw truthfulness, truthfulness, and building the performance as the product of these circumstances as if it was something that kind of resolved itself. My search was to avoid my mazes working with the structural dispositive of the theater but articulating it, choreographing it, reorganizing it in order to build something else with it. And I mean, I'm saying this about the theater, but also with the bodies. Somewhere where the structure becomes fiction and tries to avoid the expected look of structural things. Theater looking like theater, dance looking like dance, performance looking like performance. And these are sometimes expectations that the own institutions or our colleagues kind of project or over our own work. How the, do things sh shall like, how shall things also like to look contemporary? I would say now, not then, that I was busy with querying theatrical structuralism while working with the body of the theatrical dispositive in direction to blurry its identity borders, to blurry and reformulate what theatricality as the use of the space of the theater and of the bodies that inhabit it can be. Arriving sometimes also to the question of what can be a theater, like often the gallery space and the dispositives I build in it. This question comes a uh, as the aesthetic parallel of the life-size question of what does it mean to fight and be granted full right of citizenship, a body working to metamorphose into another body, metabolizing space into another space, the administration of circumstances with an autonomous movement to negotiate a dynamic, ever-changing position that one could call home. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dinesh. And uh, you can see Dinesh perform tomorrow at 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock in a space that he created, sort of, himself, because it's uh, not a space where we usually show art. Next artist is Eva Mar, and uh, you find her works in the main hall also of the exhibition. And um, she's working with sculpture and performativity. Welcome. No, but it's too long. I just lay it like this. I need uh, words to look at, not to say hello. Uh, yeah, this is an um, overall image of um, the installation upstairs. Um, yeah, I want to get everything there so you can. Um, yeah, I have got to read. Um, so the name of the installation is called No One Knows Why. Um, that took a while to come up with the title. 
and you can see a landscape of several clay bodies in different positions uh, that has been produced also during the six, la late last six years. And there's a metal and the composite construction and a big red and white textile work on the wall. Uh, the materials are dry clay, fabric, wax, metal, composite, uh, plexi, plywood, and the clay is not fired, uh, not yet, at least. Um, the installation is um, is set for me in a new way, in a, in a kind of way, because it's um, I find it very narrative. Um, something has happened. Well, the scene is arranged in a way that something has happened. Bodies lay around, violated. And there is also a metal structure in the installation, a white composite stick. I think it's composite. Co composite is a material that is um, yeah, mixed aluminum and plastic, and it, it wants to be almost like marble. Um, and, um, and it held upright uh, by the metal metal stands, and um, so I have seen both a tent uh, and um, also the Midsummer Eve stand. Mm, from the beginning I just um, wanted that, that white stick. I liked the idea of what if it just would stand upright on itself, um, but it wasn't possible. Um, so I made the metal stands to hold it upright. Um, on the wall, there is a fabric circle a pattern that is familiar. It can be a parasol, reminds of a circus, a flag, or a warning sign, uh, or the sun even. I saw this piece when we were in Joshua Tree at a residency some years ago with my husband and kids following. Um, there was sand everywhere. So I needed to make the the fabric out of necessity, the blanket as a, um, to mark where we were, to know for the kids where they where we are when they were not running around or they could sit down and um, to protect the technical gears. And um, in this environment, no roof was really needed in if it wasn't to shelter from the sun. So it became our home and a platform. Uh, or a working space also, and um, the this piece is a uh, so it, it's um, yeah, and the pattern is uh, based on an earlier work that uh, I made, um, inspired by the folkloric dress where I grew up uh, in Transylvania. I can show that too, and. The, I guess, like, li uh, I wrote this. Um, yeah, I, I, I really recognize a lot. Also, it's it's nice how you chose the artist because I recognize so much um, of you. Also, what you said, Denise. But uh, so I wrote here, like, leaving one's home is not only losing a roof over the head; it's losing the environment, a culture that your navigation system is compatible with. Um, yeah, like from how to say hello um, to knowing what food you can put in the, uh, in the mouth. So I guess to be at home must mean to feel home uh, or easily navigate in a certain system. And that takes time and trust. Um, uh, let's see. So... Yeah, I can go. Mm. So most of the bodies um, in the installation uh, are made uh, during a residency at Artlab Gniesta um, last year. I then had three co-workers whom I shared my way of thinking um, when making the, the clay bodies. I, sh um, I usually draw directly on the fabric, remember pattern making, uh, remembering pattern making for clothes from my parents' tailoring workshop, 
and then we sew together the body parts. And a character comes alive when I then fill these fabric skins with the wet clay. The two-dimensional pieces, the fabric becomes three-dimensional. For me, it's like seeing an image becoming reality. So when uh, we did this big project where I had this idea, um, like really from the beginning, like one day I would like to make a lots of bodies in the, in the same room, um, so it didn't happen until last year. So when we started to work with this, I really realized that I had to show them, even though if I don't know how to make clothes pattern perfectly, I obviously knew something because I really had to show these um, students that I was working with. So that's why we have been drawing on the floor. So we started by just like not measuring the bodies to make perfect patterns. So we just drew approximately how to make trousers and how to make a, a shirt. And so this colorful mess happened. Um, and then we continue to, so when we have these bodies, then we, um, we have some holes left uh, so we can fill them up with clay. And then the mess happens. Um, so it's all this imagery that turns up when I started to work with this. Um, So the instruction, so what happens, um, the instructions when working with the bodies after they're filled was from the beginning for myself when I started my work was to raise, uh, raise up the body in a standing position and put, the, uh, as in the metaphor, uh, standing on one's own feet. Um, and that is really... Uh, translation of uh, what I guess I've been doing like all my teenage life and everything. Um, I've been asking before I started art school and before I had a platform of how to uh, to find tools of how to work with my thoughts. Um, I was really dwelling and saying a lot of why, why this, why was my parents really had to leave and uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it was really great to get the tools to start to work with my questions. Um, so the pictures here are attempts when I, when I realized that I could make the character, make, um, make my, my way of drawings and my way of uh, the drawings, like my way of making these bodies became my way of uh, drawing the human body. I, I never learned that otherwise, and uh, like in uh, classical um, drawing lessons and stuff like that. So, and I started to try to lift these bodies up and, um, uh, and realize that they were just breaking, of course, if they, if I was like just roughly taking them up. So, um, ideas. Um, so ideas and came up during this work really of how and, and questions like whose responsibility is it really to take care of others and of myself um, and how can one help someone else like how can one um, help someone else without breaking oneself and breaking the the person who needs help. So um, I, I, st I made different tries uh, to gentle ways to, to, put, to be, be able to lift the, like I made different sessions and tried to lift up the body um, without it breaking it. Um, oh. So, yeah, we should get back to the, it's so much written and so much pictures. Um, 
Yeah, and I guess like this work, um, so this work with the, um, yeah, because this work begin with, uh, I got my second child, um, and it was, um, it was, it was so much, I realized that it was so much that happens to a woman's body uh, when you think of that it's like possible to actually uh, have a baby in your stomach being pregnant and to breastfeed at the same time and having this um, hypothetical image of the woman being penetrated in every hole. So it was like so crazy that what this woman is put out to. So I started to, I got this immense energy of um, to work, to work, to, to work through, I guess, all those ideas. Oh, let's see if you check if it's, mm -hmm. no. Men jag kanske kan fortsätta. Det måste vara nog. Jag tror att det var nog glatt. Jag kan se om jag kan göra någonting. Det är säkert. Den vill ha ett lösenord. Vad är det som händer? Så. Well, anyway. Um, I have been working with the clay bodies and been fascinated by the possibility for them to change. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, that's the reason I never fired my, um, the sculptures, because uh, I have thought that there is always, it's great that there's always a way out, that the possibilities of, of change might, uh, we can always fix things later. But um, I realized after um, starting with these clay works that it's like it's just becoming a lot of mess, and it's really uh, one's time is not enough. No. <laughs> no. Oh. Oh, this is a really strange situation. So I, oh. um, so I say that again. Uh, so give it a new chance to to make things happen. Um, but through making these bodies, their fragility and amount gave me a lot of problems, uh, logistic hell. So especially because uh, they're heavy. And lying still as a sculpture, they could last forever. But moving solid pieces around and forcing them to their limitations, that breaks them. And, um, and also in the exhibition upstairs, you can see a lot of the bodies, like, they are like you can say traumatized or having a trauma. You can also say you say it both physic for for physical trauma, like a bone is broken, is also a trauma. But also being in the trauma of um, is also something that you're traumatized is psychologically. So um. So when um, trauma happens, um, that is visible. That gives scars, and well, but I guess what I'm really interested in is the scars that actually happens um, 
when trauma happens psychologically, or um, maybe it's um, in the soul. So, um, so to going back to that um, work in Gniesta, what happened with these bodies, what, the, like all those bodies, that was um, after we filled them, then we, what we wanted to do is to give them a working position with Adam, because obviously I realized we, can, we will not be able to stand them up, to put them on their own feet. So we, made, we gave them positions that um, they can handle, in, like, like in a yoga session. So all of them made some kind of yoga except for the ones that we had the possibility to lift them up, but then they looked really dead because they were like levitating somehow. So, um, it's, um, so three of these bodies, so handling these bodies have, um, yeah, it has given me so much of insights, but uh, what, okay. Uh, we can talk later also. <laughs> um, so what happened upstairs here is um, the three of these bodies, um, when, we, when we talked about that I would be exhibiting here, that I had three of these bodies having more like um, this kind of praying positions that um, I really saw them like being destroyed in like exhibiting them here. And then also that so when they actually came here, um, I wasn't able to trash them as much as I wanted uh, because um, they are so they're ex yeah it's like one step at a time it's like one frame at a time and like the process of the work gives um, a frame for each movement. So. Um, I have written some other stuff too. Um, uh, yeah, because that's what I wanted to come back to, to the, to violence, um, to how the hell did it became so violent? Um, how did I get my work to become so violent and I guess that like um, at a point I thought that one thing to make people do other things like even just to call a friend and making them like let's go out and taking them out of their normal everyday life I found violent it's it, it required such a great energy so it's like behind everything we do it requires such a great energy, so, um, so I guess that's what happened upstairs also. <laughs> Just a um, great amount of energy um, that, um, uh, I don't know, it's like a blank. <laughs> mm. Uh, any questions on that? Thank you. Um, uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva. Uh, we'll continue, and the next uh, talk will be in Swedish, and uh, it's. Uh, Anna Karin Rasmussen will talk about her video work upstairs, who has a lot of connections with your work as well, Eva, I feel. Yeah, they're really connected. So welcome, Anna Karin. <coughs> okay, I will start to apologize for uh, that I've been chosen to talk in Swedish for you who are English talking. But uh, I'm such a nervous person and not so good in English, so. Um, okay. Uh, 
Det här eh, verket har jag med på utställningen. Och det här är några stillbilder då från det. Det är ett videoverk. Eh, och det började, jag började jobba med det eh, utifrån att jag har jobbat 15 år nu som personlig assistent. Ibland heltid och ibland när jag har eh, pluggat och så, så har det varit deltid för att finansiera eh, eller gå runt. Eh, och det, då har jag liksom funderat på det här maktförhållandet som eh, blir i rollen mellan mig som personlig assistent och till den som jag jobbar hos eller med. Eh, och att jag i den relationen sitter på så extremt mycket makt. Eh, och jag ser mig själv som en ganska så här empatisk och snäll och bra människa. Men att det ändå är en förskjutning till att, till att jag faktiskt sitter på makten. Och den här andra människan är beroende av att jag vill väl och att jag gör rätt. Och är empatisk, om man ska säga. Och jag tycker också att det är ungefär samma relation som man har till ett litet barn sen jag har blivit förälder. Men skillnaden där är ju att jag har liksom en naturlig kärlek. Så jag tänker att det är inte som det är svårare för med att se att jag skulle missbruka den här maktsituationen. Men när, när jag är i en jobbsituation med den här makten och en annan människa så tänker jag att det skulle kunna gå fel. Liksom. Eh, och man blir ju frustrerad och det är kanske irriterad på varandra och så. Men då var den här trappscenen som en, eh, ett sätt att testa det maktförhållandet eller vad man ska säga. För att det ställs liksom på sin spets eller det blir så tydligt i trappan när man hjälper någon upp för trappan. Eh, med, det är så lätt att tappa eller, eh, eller knuffa eller göra fel, tänker jag. Mm. Mm. Men ja, det var så exakt. Det var så det började. Men nu när det är klart så ser jag att det kanske mer också är ett arbete kring relationer i stort och maktbalanser mellan människor och kanske också inom en själv. Ehm, och också om så här, våld i hemmet. Jag, ett tag efter jag hade gjort det här verket så såg jag en så här, true crime dokumentärserie som heter The Staircase som är om ett fall i USA där någon, det är en kvinna som hittas död och man vet inte om hon blev puttad eller om hon har ramlat i trappan. Och då tänkte jag att det är ju väldiga likheter med det också. Mm. Mm. Sen är det väl också kanske, tänker jag, ganska tydligt så här verk kring Sisyfos arbete eller det här att man fortsätter och fortsätter och han eh, Sisyfos fick som straff att skjuta ett klipplock upp för ett berg det vet ni säkert i grekisk mytologi men, och så skulle han liksom bli fri från det här straffet ifall han lyckades ta stenen upp till toppen men så fort han närmade sig så slant han och stenen ramlade ner uh. Och jag tänker att det är lite likheter med det typen av arbete också i den här sorts vårdarbete eller liksom. Ja, jag tror det var det där. Oj, ja. Och jag visade den här första gången förra året på Konstakademin i Stockholm. Och då var det en fyra kanal i videoinstallation. Men här uppe i utställningen så är det bara en video som är kvar och en hjälpvideo på sidan som jag kan prata om lite sen. Men jag var lite nervös att det inte skulle funka för jag hade tänkt så mycket på hur de här två videosarna fungerade ihop. Och 
Men det är, jag tycker det funkar jättebra. Nu ändå. Okej, vi fortsätter. Det här är en bild från när jag jobbar med det här arbetet. Från min ateljé. Och den vänstra bilden, där håller jag på att bygga upp trappan. Av träreglar och kartong. Och i den högra bilden så håller jag på att riva trappan efteråt. Och här hade jag en stipendieatelé som hade så här högt i tak. Så det var en anledning till att jag kunde liksom tänka att jag kunde bygga den här trappan. Och själva byggandet... Eller det jag gör blir ofta videoverk. Nästan alltid. Men det finns så många delar i, det, i processen. Och dels är det här byggandet av scener, antingen stora eller små, som jag animerar i. Och sen är det liksom den här performativiteten, eller när jag, när jag agerar i dräkten på olika sätt. Och så är det också själva måleriet som jag tänker att kanske är nästan lika viktig, eller liksom att jag ser det som måleri, fast det råkar vara video. Och jag gör allting själv, alltså också typ filmning och agera och klippning och allting. Och jag tror det har att göra med att jag vill, om man ska släppa in andra i processen så måste man ha mer koll på vad man vill. Och hur det ska bli i slutändan och så. Och jag har nästan aldrig det. Utan jag, jag tänker typ, ja men som med det här, att ja men jag ska bygga en trappa. Och så ska jag testa det här eh, med mig och den andra. Eh, och vad som händer om jag eh, missbrukar makten eller vad man ska säga. Eh, men mer än så vet jag inte riktigt. Utan sen eh, agerar jag i trappan med en fast kamera. Eh, och sen när jag klipper och så då liksom tar jag fram vad som jag tyckte var viktigt eller vad som blev bra mm. och det här också tänkte jag bara skulle visa det för det är lite roligt att jag, jag brukar Nästan med allt jag gör så liksom jobbar jag typ som i parafras. Alltså att jag, eh, den bilden längst till vänster, den har Carl Fredrik Hill gjort. Eh, och sen har Rolf Hansson, en annan svensk målare, gjort en parafras på den. Och sen utgår jag ifrån det och fortsätter med min trappa. Och jag tycker att det är så skönt sätt att jobba och känna att man typ är del av en historia eller liksom att man tar vid där någon annan redan har varit och hållit på. Typ. Men det är väl mer som en ingång eller som att komma igång. Så tycker jag det funkar bra. Ja. Jag ska säga någonting mer om dräkten också. Tänkte jag som jag har på mig. Det är oftast eh, samma typ av dräkt. Ibland är den lite rödare och ibland är den lite beigeare och så. Men det är samma typ av kroppstrumpedräkt liksom, som jag har på mig när jag gör mina verk. Och det, det började som att först var jag målare och sen gick jag över och började animera för att få eh, rörelse i målningarna kanske. Tror jag. Uh, och, och för att jobba med liksom något rörligt tyckte jag var väldigt kul. Och då, då animerade jag bara såna här små lergubbar eller lerfigurer. Och sen var det som att jag tog på mig dräkten för att uh, klä ut mig till lerdockan eller den animerade dockan för att kunna spela in närbilder. Uh, med mig i, utklädd till dockan. Ungefär som man gör i kanske skrotnisse om man har sett den eller andra filmer. Ehm. Och det blev som ett sätt att typ spara tid och så. Och sen märkte jag att det var mer och mer intressant att vara i, i dräkten och eh, filma mig själv i hel kropp och att 
Så nu är det bara ibland som jag använder mig av animationen och nästan jämt som, att, som jag agerar liksom själv. Och att jag har kvar dräkten det är för att typ gå in i en figur. Att det inte ska vara jag utan att jag eh, blir en figur som ett verktyg. Typ. Tror jag. Mm. Sen är jag sista sliden. Då kan man tänka, tänka att det här är så här saker jag lägger till till verken för att få för att styra dem lite eller för att göra ett så här tillägg. Och då brukar jag använda mig av vad jag kallar så här hjälpvideos eh, som jag gör hela tiden parallellt med de större verken. Och eh, då är det den här som jag visar här uppe som är, eh, det är en hjälpvideo som kommer med ljudet. Och det är ljudet av så här fingrarna som trummar. Eh, och jag tänker att det liksom är väntan på att någonting ska hända eller att någonting kommer hända eller att någonting måste hända. Typ. Eh. Mm. Och sen en annan sak som, är så här, som man kan lägga till det är till exempel titeln. Och då heter det här verket Mater Nostra och det kom sig av från Pater Noster som eh, betyder Fader Vår som är en sån här kristen bön och, men det är också en sorts grävmaskin och det var egentligen därifrån jag fick namnet det, där uppe till höger ser man den så här, från förra sekelskiftet så använde man såna där och det är liksom där vad heter det? Fortsatta grävandet och grävandet så att det skovlar upp lika mycket hela tiden. Och den har tagit sitt namn från radbanden eller där man räknar böner som ibland kallas för paternosterband tror jag. Och jag tyckte det var en ganska fin så här liknelse för det där oändliga arbetet som trappan blev också. Och men också eh, att jag döpte den till Mater Nostra, det blir moder vår. Och det får också så här, eh, peka på moderskapet. Både det faktiska moderskapet tänker jag då, till sitt barn, men också till i större bemärkelse på något sätt. Till andra människor eller hur vi hur vi hjälps åt, empatiskt och så vidare. Och sen hade jag lagt in en bild på The Staircase där. Det var kanske inte behövligt, men det var, det var nog mer för att visa hur saker som så här, man tar upp runt omkring en eh, ändrar hur man tänker på sina verk. Eh, för att det var efter jag hade sett den som jag tänkte att det varit mycket ett verk kring typ våld i hemmet och, och så. Och, ja, det var det. Tack så mycket Anna-Karin. We have come to the last uh, speaker, and that is, um, who is uh, Cara Tolmi. And she is presenting her work, Can Come On, in the exhibition, both in the gallery and also in the cinema. And as a performance, she did it yesterday evening and she did it also at the opening night. Welcome, Kara. Hi. Uh, Jana, is it possible to mute the screen? Thank yeah. Thank. Okay, uh, hi. Um, sorry, introducing another accent into the room. Um, yes, yeah, so I thought I would just try and reflect a little bit on this work, Kankaman, that's in the exhibition in as many uh, forms as it was possible, apparently. Um, so the work within this work, this performance work and video work, I... Uh, I sample, I'm still looking for the right word for this, whether it's sample 
citation, quotation. Um, yeah, so I sample actually four songs. It says three songs in the blurb, but it's actually four. Those four songs are uh, a song called Grung by um, a woman called Zabel Panosian, who was around in the early 1900s. Then two songs by Archie Shep and Jean Lee, uh, Blasé, and there is a Bam and Gilead. And then the last one is by Jean Lee again and Ran Blake, uh, and it's a cover of Something's Coming from West Side Story. Um, so this sampling or citation, sometimes I call it somatic sampling. It's kind of a practice of taking small fragments from music usually and kind of bringing them into my body, repeating them through my voice. Um, so most of my work is at the moment is performance and it somehow works with singing. Uh, so I really work between being an artist and being a musician. Um, okay, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about this sampling practice. And I'm going to start off by reading out a kind of disclaimer about doing this. Uh, I am troubled... I'm going to do this. <laughs> I am troubled by the position I put myself in with reg regards to appropriation of sounds that come from bodies who have different racial, gender, cultural and temporal positions to my own. I know that there is a potential violence that I risk in decontextualizing these distinct samples from their whole works. I know that there are subjectivities and conditions producing some of these sounds that I personally cannot relate to nor fathom. What I can say at this point is that this practice for me has to a large extent been about naming. Naming or perhaps laying bare my chosen guardians, my custodians, my feeders, giving dues to those who have impressed upon me and enabled me to make the work in the way that I do. Articulate their proximity to my work be honest about who those bodies are who nourish me, give form to that lineage. My intention is not to render this act within the defining qualities of the word appropriation, but rather through words such as learning and impression. There's a Sarah Ahmed quote that I find really useful when thinking about this word impression. What separates us from others also connects us to others. This paradox is clear if we, think about, if we think of the skin surface itself as that which appears to contain us, but where others impress upon us. This contradictory function of skin begins to make sense if we unlearn the assumption that the skin is simply already there and begin to think of the skin as a surface that is felt only in the event of being impressed upon in encounters we have with others. If I were to think of the grain of my singing voice as a touchable, malleable, sorry, a touchable material or a skin, a surface, it would not be a uniform hide. It would be a stretching membrane, contorted in opposite directions, embossed by the bodies of my custodians, wounded and inflected, easily led astray by trend and pleasure, thirsty. My experiments, in, in, my experiments inhabiting the sounds of those who have impressed upon me has been an attempt to put myself into the situation of the sound that they leave behind, even if gaining insight into the actual sensation of their subjective experience in doing so is untenable. This somatic sampling has been a way for me to learn about impossibility, discrepancy and difference. To push my capacity, to force myself to make sounds from uncomfortable positions, even just to understand the technicality and materiality of those sounds which are meaningful to me. To repeat those sounds. To repeat, meaning to seek backwards. I attempt to inhabit this feedback to stay with the difficulty that it may present, to tighten the edges of the loops I initiate, 
to be rigorous and still within that tightness, to empty out, to fill up, to touch and to hold, to break, to mend, to be defined by, to reinscribe. Um, so a while back, I started writing letters to these people who I sampled from. And I wanted to think about complicating this notion of influence, because I think it's a really big part of uh, art education is knowing who you're like who you're influenced by. And often it's um, talked about as like a very straightforward relationship of I'm really in awe of this figure. Uh, and I think it's not that straightforward sometimes things end up in your work that have come from other people that have more complicated relationships. Like you might have a problem with something that you've taken from them. So I wanted to try and personalize these relationships and look at the texture of how they exist. So I wanted to read out the letter that I wrote. I actually rewrote it for today uh, to Jean Lee, this singer who I sampled a lot in this work and who is a really, she's been a really important singer for me. She was a singer and a dancer and a poet and uh, yeah, I've th thought about her a lot. Dear Jean, the way they say, the way they say, the way they say, your words, not mine. In these last days of total disintegration, where every day is a struggle against becoming an object in someone else's nightmare. Your words, not mine. It was about balm, a word you use, a word you asked me to consider that I hadn't thought much about before. A friend of mine, a poet named Mira Mata writes, does a wound declare an extraction or an opening? Does a balm seal and complete, or does it, in entering through the body's largest organ, the skin, remind us how to let holding be absorbed? It wasn't until some time later that I began to use that word to explain the performance I made. The word balm was not really how it began. Now, the following story is not part of the official blurb. I don't usually tell strangers how it actually happened. However, I don't consider you to be a stranger, and plus, I feel that you are implied, and therefore, I owe you some form of explanation. It was an unfounded summer when I made Cancaman. That time for me, on a personal note, was groundless, disoriented, and needy. In the midst of this, a large collective shock was announced. It fell fast, like a dense wet blanket on top of us, on top of the rooms we slept in, the rooms we worked in, the rooms we fought in, the rooms we stroked one another in, the rooms we performed in. It made us fear that our roofs would collapse, but they didn't. So we continued to sleep and work and fight in these rooms, but now, all of our activities smelt like wet blanket. And nobody had any idea whether they should be trying to eradicate, treat, fight, understand, or acclimatize to this new smell. I had been commissioned to make a performance. I sat in the room where I was due to perform. It smelt like wet blanket. I smelt like wet blanket. The people who would attend this performance also smelt like wet blanket and could smell wet blanket on one another and in the fabric around them. I don't make work about wet blankets. I don't know how to. But neither am I able to ignore the way strong smells make me feel, especially inside the rooms where I perform. I had no idea how to make something in a room like this. I did not feel like making anything inside this room but I had been commissioned, so I tried to work. I repeated some old tricks. They were unconvincing. I tried out some kind of, oh, fuck it, just let whatever come out approach. 
This produced some terrible material. I even experimented with cutting up tiny pieces of the wet blanket and shuffling them around, but this felt completely disingenuous. So, at a complete loss, I did something that had always worked for me before. I listened to music. Like it does in any state, my body held on to some sounds and rejected others. Some seeped indirectly and filled me up. Others bounced off my skin or flew past me. Many of your sounds made it in, Jean. A song titled Grung by Isabel Panosian also soaked through. Absorbing these sounds was the first full and sensible thing I had been able to feel since entering that room. And so I clenched my body so as not to lose them. And it was in this state holding on to a collection of fragments left behind by you and Zabel, that I finally made the performance Kankaman. At such moments, one does not move to the sound, one is the movement of the sound, created and born by it. Hence, nothing is difficult. Someone else's words, not ours. By this point, we were quite familiar. I had spent many hours with your words, your vocal rises and releases, the personality of your meter. You had made a deep impression on me, which was probably why your sound sunk in so easily on that day. I had a sense from this foundation that I could try to climb inside the particulars of the way you sang, the way they say, your a cappella melody, your cover of Something's Coming with the knowledge that my actions were just one in a series of encounters between us, a long-term trajectory in the beginnings of its own lexicon, a way to learn something in a manner I did not yet understand. There was a sense of familiarity that I didn't necessarily have the words to articulate, a lopsided familiarity of my own invention that I knew may contain its own dangers and violences, a relationship that could never be reciprocated by you, even if it continued to evolve for me. I remind myself now that one should be cautious of the feeling of ownership that can accidentally arise out of an earnest sense of familiarity and admiration. I feel that I have a meaningful and personal relationship to you through what you've left behind, through the many hours I've spent with you, through the spectrum of emotions, ideas, and excitements that you have triggered within me. But what does that make me believe I have the right to do? What does that make me feel is allowable? What permission do I give myself to become a kind of protector or proliferator of your influence because of these feelings? And it's important to say, if I didn't already, that um, both Isabel Panosian and Jean Lee are now dead. And what is it that I make visible? What is it that I transcribe? Is it really you and your work? Or is it the shape of your impression upon my skin? An impression that may be so contorted that nobody would necessarily recognize it unless I put a name tag next to it. And how might this name tag produce its own contradictions? In parts of the performance, I attempted simple, technical occupations of your sounds. I tried to echo your voice as faithfully as I could, as pathetic and problematic as that may have been. As it turned out, this task of pronouncing the way they say, which also constitutes the first five minutes of the performance can come in, became a sort of preparation for myself, kneading my attention into shape, making me more susceptible to the suspension of disbelief that I would need to summon in order to enact the second half of the performance. The more I go on, I find it necessary to prepare my body in order to perform. My own rituals around this have begun to solidify into a routine. I think a lot about eating, the weight of the food and the time needed to digest it in advance, sustenance. Mapping in advance the space I will perform in has become more important to me although it's not always possible. The most indispensable is now a decent vocal warm-up 
and a vigorous pleasure dance, on my own, often in a toilet, usually to club-inflected pop music, as close to the performance as is possible. This must be done until I sweat and feel excitable. I need these pre preparations in order to be susceptible, to trust my own malleability, to reach credible actions, to touch the perversity that makes it all worthwhile for me. This preparation has always been a private one. However, I enjoy easing more congruous preparations into the fabric of the performance itself. My repetition of the way they say was one such example of this. In this instant, instance, the preparation was to get me ready for another performative exploration, a kind of possession, the second part of the performance that I mentioned earlier. I invoke a persona, one that might be able to discover the limits of that word we were both thinking about, bam. I named this character Kankaman. Kankaman is the name of one of the plants thought to be the balm of Gilead, a rare perfume used medicinally, mentioned in the Bible, and utilized figurative, in figurative speech as simple, symbolizing a universal cure. And of course, this came from the Balm of Gilead, a song performed by you. I did not wish to place the phrase's biblical connotations within Kankaman's identity. She was not named for God, but for your grain Jean, for Malachi Favors Modesty, for Dave Burrell's dispaced intervals, and for Lester Bowie and Archie Shep's sinking down touch, undulating, disquiet. I don't know if Kankaman infused me or if I infused her. My body was prepared for either. If I try and touch the feeling of being with her, I would say it's sometime both at the same time. We pull one another, winding one another into traction, calming, compressing, squeezing. Perhaps this gives me some clue about the reason for her taut physicality, her tightness, her ability to pull a room far too close towards her, the tension of her control. Maybe this aspect of her nature depends on our perpetual, perpetually oscillating co-possession, stretched tight between us. She is able to soothe me. She is able to soothe me whilst also being impervious to me. She is sensible. She slows, strokes, calms, demands, Tight, direct, pragmatic. Two years after making this performance, I was asked by two separate institutions at the same time to revisit Kankaman, Lud Galeriet in Bergen and Moderna Museet in Stockholm. I was no longer feeling the same kind of groundless disorientation. There were many other feelings in my body, but they were not the same as they had been then. I wondered to myself why these separate people found some meaning in this performance at the same time, two years after its creation. I wondered if I should bring it back to life in this new body, a body that now felt different things. I grappled then, and I still do, with the ethical implications of representing this performance within these two new contexts, or at all a work that feels fragile and time-specific, full of unanswered questions that continue to trouble me now. How would I find the appropriate feelings to be inside the right sensibility in order to perform this work in any genuine way again? What would we write in the gallery blurbs and bios about this work? What would I say about you and Zabel? Was it more ethical to name you or to leave you out of it? What would I say about the way your sounds had entered my body in that room that smelt like wet blanket two years ago? How could I do this in a way that would avoid me profiting from you? Was this even possible? How could I credit you without turning us both into symbols of abusive histories? Was this even possible? And if this was not possible, should I ever make this work public again? How could I find a way to sit within this, to stay open and yet uneasy with the, these within these irre irreconcilable contradictions. 
How could I stand for what I did two years ago and how could I explain it? And how did I feel about the potential of this work, doing this over and over again from here on? What could its future be? I wanted to finish this letter with some more words from Mira. In these last days of total disintegration, I look around and recognize not the faces, but their expressions, unhinged. It is 2018 and half my friends are losing their minds. To sit inside yourself, crouching, always, braced, to encounter yourself only in crisis, to be always under your own emergency is comprehensible, but will make you cruel. Emotion, or potential emotion, or emotion's potential, is viewed as if from a watchtower, like an enemy approaching, speculative only. Unfelt, it stalks the perimeter. To speculate on a future feeling, or a feeling future, is to speculate on a future at all. You know you're not doing the enemy's work if the divorce from hope feels and is understood not as a wrench, but rather as relief, that is, space, necessary. We will learn not only to feel, but how. Her words, not ours. No words, only a feeling. Your words. Yours, Cara. Thank you, Cara. And um, uh, we have a couple of minutes to wrap it up. <laughs> and uh, please, Joa and Santiago and the rest of you, Take your seats here, and um, there will be questions and answers, I hope. Uh, uh, Hi. Uh, thanks to all you lost souls out there in the audience who are with us still. Um, and thanks to everybody here who has uh, given these in really interesting and varied uh, presentations. Uh, something which I wanted to start thinking about or talking about was the idea of the listening body. Uh, so the body not as physical object or entity, or but more as something which uh, takes in histories, takes in sounds, uh, absorbs uh, goings on in the street in Damascus, um, considers the idea of uh, shifting uh, cultural or, or national context, I suppose. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm thinking maybe I could just open it up and get some reflections on what the, what the idea of a listening body could be as a sort of uh, radical con con construct, let's say, of how we exist in this world. Kara, you want to start? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, what could I say about that? I mean, you know I think about listening a lot and like what... Um, I think it was interesting, I really related to how Muhammad was talking about 
you know, these like characters which find you. Um, and maybe I can, like that, I, I could relate to a lot when I was describing this Kankaman character finding me. Like it, there's the, within the performance I made, there's these very uh, technical or um, thinking processes. And then there's this other part which is totally about this thing which finds me that I don't, I, I don't decide on. Um, but I think there's some, uh, for me, being able to do that has maybe come from practices of improvisation uh, and a, like literally musical improvisation with other musicians. Um, and that was something I really had to learn was like how, f how listening wasn't necessarily about hearing exactly what other people were playing, but it was about sort of suspending your attention so that you're able to listen through responding. Uh, but that response is not like a thing that you're deciding upon. It's, it's, quite a, it's quite a difficult thing to put into words actually, but I know that it's, for me it's a bit of about, a let, letting, listening can be about a letting go. Um, and like a, I'm listening through moving or I'm listening through making sound rather than hearing exactly the sounds that are coming from other people. So I think there's something about this, like what state does your body have to be in in order to be open enough to let information come through you that you're that you're a collaborator with, but not a controller of. Yeah, I mean, I feel the same way when I'm thinking about work that I'm making, and I think this also lent its or this was something which was central to our process in terms of how we approached the project, how we decided to try and uh, visit different types of artists and see different types of practice practices was to basically open up a space where we could be receptive uh, and contribute and sort of see if the the um, third thing, the third point of the triangle comes out of that. And it definitely felt very, uh, well, it shouldn't be, but it felt a, a step a step in the right direction compared to how things are usually done in, in uh, this context. Mm. I just thought, can I, does this work? Yeah. yeah. Uh, since we don't have so many minutes left, uh, I was just also curious to hear if there are any questions in the audience perhaps, or, yeah. or if you guys have questions to each other also. <laughs> Maybe first, if there are any questions in the audience. Yes, there is one. There. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Should we just... Thanks. Actually, the question is for you. <laughs> uh, the thing I just thought of was, when you asked the question to the panel, why would you decide to use the verb listening in terms of body, and not go with sensing, as as the body senses so much, and listening is just one of the sense that that body can do. Just a thought. Uh, no, a good question. Um, hmm. uh, it seemed, I guess, a little bit. Uh, it's just, I think, it's just a way of uh, framing in the simplest possible terms. I guess we understand what listening is and I think obviously we're an image driven uh, society or species almost at this point but there is something about language and music which uh, which uh, goes directly into the center of our sort of like senses basically and so I thought it was just a nice way to think of, of or to have that framework and the phrase it has also been used by uh, Claire Butcher, who's actually a Zimbabwean uh, writer and theorist. Um, yeah, so it was a reference to that, basically. <laughs> but it's not fixed in any, in any way. I don't know. Can I also answer a little bit your question? Yeah. Hello? Hey? Hey, hey. Is it working? Yes. Yeah. yeah. OK. But <laughs> No, but I was, uh, this process of uh, writing, what I read today was a bit complicated. And this morning I was going through this text again, 
and I was feeling that I went very much, very much uh, on the side of. of uh, that these microphones aren't this kind of idea of skin color. Um, uh, yeah, this morning I was going through this text and I was like, uh, I was feeling that a big thing missed in, in this text and it was to do with this, uh, because I think all, the, all, this, all my works are working in a very strange relationship in between all these questions of citizenship that were kind of protagonist in, in what I said but I think I skipped a lot of my queer preoccupations. And uh, I really think that my work uh, sweats a lot of uh, what does it mean to be a queer body in this process of migration. And uh, what does it mean to... Um, and that, I mean, I remember this because you were talking about contamination and obviously this is a very uh, important question. And also, um, there was an image that, Catherine was very empowering me about bringing images that I was uh, a bit, uh, I decided to not do because I think I need a lot of uh, uh, w uh, relevance to bring any image into a space. But um, there was in fact one image that is a video clip that was on the TV of this uh, uh, Brazilian people in uh, favela and they they are dragging, they are doing these drag dance videos with some smartphone. And uh, they have these bricks that they found that they attach to their uh, shoes as a brick. And a bit as uh, someone was talking about the influences that we get and things that we quote and we don't know that we quote. And I think I just discovered after one year that I was wearing this brick that I was in the performer upstairs. I was like, yes, there is this image. Um, but obviously I think there, there is for me s so much about, uh, I think that when you, when, when we are talking about identities that have to be reformulated, that have to be kind of, I mean, there is this question about migrating, that is when you arrive to a new space and suddenly no one, it's like a part of your history was erased because no one knows what you were before, what you did before, I mean, both on a personal and on a, on a professional level. And suddenly everything that you are, you have to be in that minute. And I feel that when you have like 20 years of history that were kind of erased from you, you are in a very permeable state. So you are constantly kind of trying to make your identity happen or your what you are now happen out of the things that are very immediately around you. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I got a bit lost, but uh, yeah. I think I, I mean we can we can think in the same way about the absor absorbency of this particular paper that Mohammed used in uh, Damascus, which was originally meant for absorbing, you know, for for storing potatoes, let's say, uh, but which you felt as a way you sort of absorbed not only the the marks, but well the yeah, what you had inside of you or psychologically, uh, you know, that was coming out onto the paper, I suppose. Or what you witnessed, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. It's functioning. Well, <laughs> well now, sorry. Yeah, uh, actually, it's just when we talk about it, it's listening. <laughs> just, I want to just talk. Uh, sometimes I, I was just thinking, can my hand listen something, you know, can my legs or my belly or what is this uh, listening? So uh, I can give example of, till now actually when I hear some uh, strong uh, sound or something is hard, it's like I still feel like it's like a bomb, so it's like all my body shake, it's like not it's not like just my ear is, is hearing this. It's like all my body is affected with these uh, sounds and with uh, the reaction of what it, this uh, could be. Yeah, um, yeah so uh, it's like how, you, how your body is like working in, the, in these situations. It's like finding the materials or finding uh, um, something you can experience 
express, like to, to talk about what, what you want to, to, to present, it's, it's not like only just you decide to do this. It's like also the, the what you know, what your unconsciousness working, uh, and also subconsciousness is super interesting in these points because it's used to working with reputation, to used to working with what we, it's like the, the steps to, to knowing, to doing something. So if you can convert this, situation to to make the artwork so it's uh, um, I think we have to be present all time our body also need to be present I think I I, um, I could just add uh, some reflection uh, on the, it's like about um, the knowledge like the knowledge you have uh, is everything you have experienced is uh, is, is the knowledge and I guess that's, um, it's not that you have to go to school and then you know things. It's like what you have lived. So I don't know if it's the listening body, but the body is listening definitely all the way from zero to um, all the time. So I guess, um, yeah. Mm. Um, what knowledge is it really we have through what we have experienced? And how is it possible to see it as a resource? I guess there are like questions that... I'm thinking about also. Um, yeah, I think the word knowledge is quite <laughs> heavy for this way. Because when we talk about the knowledge, I think we talk about uh, the way we are in action to getting something. It's not just like the things happen normally in the daily life, in every moment. So I think it's something maybe more more far than the knowledge. I don't know what's the right word for it. Is, uh, well, we can also expand the definition of it, I suppose. There's, we can claim emotional intelligence as much as analytical intelligence. Um, and there's also, let's not forget the step of translation or consubstantiation to uh, compelling art practice, let's say, something which a visitor can come across and interact with an experience and take something away from which is for them uh, yeah moving or, or or emancipating or enlightening in some in some sense um, yeah. yeah sorry no i i i yes i kind of understand what you were saying with this um, i think it's a bit of a Sometimes I feel it's a bit of a problem of how we talk in Sweden because sometimes we open so much the concepts, like the concept of violence, the concepts of uh, permeabil <laughs> permeability that things become anything else. Like uh, I, I remember in, when you were speaking, you were saying this thing that like phoning a friend and taking them out of home, it's uh, in itself an expression of a big violence and it requires a lot of effort but i also think that at a certain point it's important to narrow down uh things because i mean i don't know if i can say that phoning a friend and taking them out of home is a big effort when i i mean when i talk about the questions that i was kind of talking when people are like forced to move countries whole populations or uh i mean or when we talk yeah i mean there is uh, i think something is violence and then we can, I mean, we can recognize uh, violence in everyone's life, and that's also maybe what allows us to empathize with other expressions of violence. But then there is violence. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with you. It's really just about that. Um, I, um, yeah, it was totally of my finally imagining of how much energy uh, everything requires and. And when actually something has happened, it has happened and everything. Ha uh, so, yeah, forget the phone. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really, it's, uh, it's really is that when things happen, they have happened. It's mm. not that something you can draw back. Uh, and, yeah, 
and I'm definitely with you on the violence. <laughs> on the expression, it's the same thing as um, my son is getting a stress thing on during a lesson, like the kids are so stressed today, and I don't think that they are stressed, and I think it's a very overused word, because mm. a stressed kid is someone who has really been in pressure and uh, I think that's severe stress. That's a very funny. I, I went to, I went to the therapist the first time after some years of coming to Sweden because you have to do it's part of like to get your citizenship. No, I'm joking. But uh, uh, and then I went to my and I was telling her I'm a bit tired and I'm a bit not so. And and then she said, oh, but uh, do you think you are depressed? And I said, but I mean that's why I'm here. Like I, I'm not going to tell you if I'm depressed. You you know. Mm. And she was like, no, but I mean you you have to know. And I think this is very interesting for me because I don't think that in Portugal no one will feel self-entitled to say, I'm depressed. And then I have all these Swedish friends that come to the uh, doctor and say, yeah, I'm very depressed. And then, uh, I think that's also a question of like, um, who is entitled, in fact, to these things? I mean, who is... Yeah, I think that's very... Um, I discovered this thing some years ago that in Europe, I mean, we leave this thing of open borders and etc. But in fact, there is three kinds of passports in Europe. There is the passport AAA and AAA, and it gives you different kinds of, it's like a code that they have. So if you go in the airport, like when I moved to Sweden, for example, a lot of times I would be pushed to a wall and asked where I was before, where I was before the place that I was before, and where I was before the place that I was before the place that I was before. Because they were like, I mean, Portuguese person moving they will want to move somewhere um, and and I mean these are very bureaucratic and evident questions but I also it's also very interesting for me on how how citizenship manifests in what you self entitle yourself to do or not to do or what spaces you self entitle yourself to take or not to take and then I'll shut up any Thoughts or questions from yeah, the Yeah, we are past our time actually, but oh. maybe we can have one or two questions if there is any. No. Uh, thank you all so much for your presentations. I think it was yeah, really thank you very much. rich and rewarding. Thanks. Thanks for coming.